My name is Norman Goodwin. I'm president of Beacon Marine Limited. On May the 1st, 1971, I left my former employer to become the fifth owner of Beacon Marina. At that time, we had to generate our own electricity and the office telephone was an extension of the pay telephone booth, one of two in the area. How times have changed. All of the boats were moved by hand for winter storage. Some of them were hoisted over the water on timbers using chain blocks. The two largest boats were hauled out of the water using a steam-powered railway. In the 23 years that followed, with the help of my wife Laura, our son Lauren, his wife Rosemary, and the endearing support of our customers, the business grew slowly. Our customers proved to be true friends. Staying with us all through the high waters and flooded store of 1973 and the terrible fire of 1981, which took so many of their boats. In 1994, we acquired Reed Marine at Point of Barrel Station. We then closed the last remaining business at Old Point of Barrel. In 2005 and 2006, we completed our transition by replacing the outdoor rack and car storage system with a two modern enclosed storage buildings. To sum up, I want to say it has been a pleasure to serve in and be a part of the unique and special community of Point of Arrow. Hi, it's Andy from DeMaison's. We've had a long history in Point of Barrel, going back to Albert DeMaison working at the Ojibwe Club in the early 1900s. Hamilton Davis noticed right away that Albert had an obvious knack for mechanics, and by 1923, he was working full-time at the Ojibwe Club, and it wasn't long before he was in charge of the boat shop and all maintenance tasks. In the early 1960s, Albert and his sons bought the property in the station along the highway and DeMaison's became one of the largest GRU and oldest OMC dealers in Ontario, soon after they purchased the land where DeMaison sits today. The DeMaison's family continued to operate the marina and construction company until 1998 when Tanya and I purchased it. DeMaison's had built an organization that prided itself on high standards of quality and customer service and a passion that was shared by us as well. Our vision for DeMaison's was built on the foundation of strong relationships both in our staff family and our customers. We employ over 50 staff members and the majority of them are from the local Point of Barrel community. We've been fortunate to have solid growth in both the marina and construction divisions at DeMaison's. This is directly related to our quality product lines, exceptional long-term staff and fantastic loyal growing customers. Tanya and I have a passion for people and are truly grateful that we've been able to do what we do in this incredible place. Payne Marine has been an integral part of the Point of Barrel community since the early 1960s when Vince Payne and his son Mike started the marina from nothing more than a piece of vacant land and a dream. Over the past 56 years our family-owned marina has flourished into one of the most well-respected and highly regarded marinas on Georgian Bay. Our marina is recognized North America wide for our unparalleled customer service and top quality product offerings from Hunt, Scout and Limestone boats as well as Yamaha outboards. Payne Marine has won countless awards over the years including the Yamaha 5 Star and Boating Industry Magazine's Top 100 Award each numerous times. The marina is also a certified five diamond clean marine, demonstrating our commitment to the land and our waters through environmentally responsible business practices. Payne Marine continues to flourish with the same mission and guiding principles that helped define the company in 1961. Never striving to be the biggest, only the best in each and every aspect of our operations and where a friendly smile and a firm handshake are still the preferred way to do business.
At the end of a long, narrow inlet in the heart of Georgian Bay's famed 30,000 islands is a tiny village called Point of Barrel. Point of Barrel is situated on Highway 69 between Toronto and Sudbury. Point of Barrel actually originated in the late 1800s, nearly 11 kilometers west of its present location. The original Point of Barrel was perched, as you can see in these photos, at the very edge of the open water on the rocky eastern shore of historic Georgian Bay. Communities establish in specific locations for specific reasons. People's ability to sustain themselves is foremost in determining where to live. Often the availability of natural resources is key to the decision to set down roots. Transportation is equally critical to where people live. It is essential to the initial arrival of explorers and pioneers. It is necessary to the ongoing supply of materials and food that cannot be produced locally. Down the line, transportation allows the export of goods or products to markets. This is a story of a community that came into existence because of the combined availability of both natural resources and transportation. What makes this story unusual is that when both natural resources and transportation changed over time, this community did not become a ghost town like so many small towns do. Point of Barrel moved. That's right, it moved 11 kilometers to the east. It regenerated itself where new transportation and economic opportunities arose to create an even more perfect setting for a thriving commercial center and a rich community life. To understand the origins of Point of Barrel, one must first understand the practicalities of fishing in the mid to late 1800s. In the beginning, there were no motors. Fishermen relied on the wind and oars to power their boats. Transportation of the catch from the fishing grounds by sailing vessel was slow, and fish is not a commodity that does well on long journeys without refrigeration. To be profitable, fish packed in ice in wooden crates had to get quickly to the large urban markets. That meant fish had to go by rail. Before steamboats, Meaford was the closest railhead available to Georgian Bay's fishing fleet, and it determined how far the fleet could go. On the other shore of Georgian Bay, where Point of Barrel is now, there was nothing. There were no railroads and no roads. Commercial fishing along this eastern shore was simply not possible. The steam tug changed all that. The faster tug allowed eastern shore fish to be brought across the bay from where it sped away by rail. Gilbert McIntosh and his son John were the first to use their steam tug to convoy a fleet of the Mackinac skiffs across the bay to Point of Barrel in the early 1880s. Point of Barrel was an ideal base for commercial fishing operations because of its safe channel into the protected islands. And yes, there really was a light in a barrel. A whiskey barrel, said to have been lost by early French voyageur fur traders, was hoisted on a pole at the end of a point of land marking the entrance of the narrow passage. That landmark barrel gave the village its name. Decades later, the light in the barrel would be lit each evening by the first returning fishermen. It guided the rest of the fishing and lumber fleets safely home. McIntosh's chose an island just inside the channel entrance as their base. They constructed buildings and docks to house men for the summer fishing season. Captain W.H. Oldfield, son of Samuel E. Oldfield, who was the first lighthouse keeper at Point of Barrel, was the first of a long line of Oldfield fishermen in Point of Barrel. He purchased sailboats in 1887 and established his business on Double Island, adjacent to the McIntosh operation. The old fields harvested the abundant lake trout, whitefish and pickerel from the rich fishing grounds around Point of Barrel. Several generations of old fields remained active in the commercial fishing industry here over many decades. A local fleet of 15 sailboats and the Macintosh steam tug were documented here in 1890. In 1900, the commercial fishing based population was around 100. Point of Barrel was becoming a village with as many as seven commercial fishing operations, all needing supplies. 
By 1894, John McIntosh moved his fishing business across the main channel next to the lighthouse. He built living quarters, a general store, and an ice house. The lucrative commercial fishing industry would decline in the 1950s. The Dorothy May was the last Oldfield boat to fish in Point of Barrel waters, closing the chapter on a near 60-year reign of the legendary Oldfield fishing fleet. The Tiffin family were the last to fish commercially in Point of Barrel, finally closing their operation in 1984. Point of Barrel's commercial fishing industry had a run of nearly a century. The fishermen were the founders of the original Point of Barrel village at the lighthouse. The lighthouse at Point of Barrel was built in 1889 to guide the commercial fishermen and growing steamer traffic. The lighthouse is automated now and no longer needs a keeper of the light. While lake trout, whitefish and pickerel were the mainstay of the early Point of Barrel fishing business, other fish would also shape the development of Point of Barrel. A bounty of black bass, northern pike, and muscalunge made this a sport fisherman's paradise. The eastern shore of Georgian Bay was becoming a magnet for recreationists as early as the late 1800s, encouraged by the private fishing clubs and rail and shipping companies. Responding to the increasing popularity of Point of Barrel, Samuel Oldfield, the lighthouse keeper, built the Bellevue Hotel in 1900 on the south shore of the channel entrance just across from the lighthouse. In 1902, Helen Davis with her friends the H.T. Mosiers left Rochester to explore the northern lakes by steamer. They stopped at the Bellevue and, captivated by the beauty of the area, remained for an extended stay. Before they left, both Davis and the Mosiers had purchased islands. Many more would come as tourists around the turn of the century and leave as island owners. In 1903, Hamilton Davis foresaw the railway lines pushing northward, making access far easier than the days-long steamer journeys of the time. Davis bought a 42-acre island and in 1906 built the impressive Ojibwe Hotel, establishing a second epicenter for island life just a few kilometers south of the lighthouse. Over the first few decades of the 1900s, commercial fishing and the tourist and sport fishing industries boosted the population at the lighthouse. And they come over and fish and then they built cabins to stay in and they stayed. That's what started a community here, like 1,500 boats running on the Georgian Bay at that time. When the tourist industry come, it was all supplied by the steamships. And all your groceries had to come from somewhere and the fish had to go out on them. People bought islands through the 1910s, 1920s and 30s and set up summer camps and built cottages. Many of those cottages remain with the original families five and six generations later. W.H. Oldfield built a grocery and supply store on Double Island, seen in this 1914 photo. The store would run for nearly five decades. Oldfields also ran a bustling transportation business, featuring the steamer the Mazeppa, which delivered supplies and carried passengers from Perry Sound. Albert Richardson opened a boat repair and storage business in Pike Bay, just east of the lighthouse, in 1916. His son Cliff, renowned boat designer, built his wooden beauties in their Meaford boat works through the winters, and the family spent the rest of the year at their marina in Point of Barrel. There are still one or two of these original Richardson boats, lovingly maintained and regularly in use in our area. Pictured here is the Aguindi, still on regular duty. In 1907, a church was built at the point and a school was established for the children of the fishing families. The Point of Barrow Islanders Association was formed in 1908 to protect and further the interests of the property owners in every way possible. Seasonal and permanent residents are welcomed as members and on the board. Pabia's first committees reflected the concerns of the whole community. Fire protection, transportation, mail, fishing, regatta, sanitation, preserving the scenic beauty and channel navigation. 109 years later, Pabia continues to provide services, events and advocate for its members and the community as a whole. 
Ice was probably the most important commodity of the time. It was the only way to keep fresh food. Perishables were rushed by rowboat and canoe from the point stores to the ubiquitous ice boxes back at the cottage. For the hotels and tourist camps in the area, ice was indispensable. And, of course, commercial fishing would have been impossible without ice for shipping. They needed enormous quantities to last through summer and fall. Ice was cut in giant blocks by handsaw from the frozen bay, where it would often grow to a thickness of 30 inches or more. Teams of men and horses walked out to the job site each day and cut blocks that were floated or hauled to the storage buildings called ice houses. As soon as the ice got uh, put in the ice house, uh, that was my job. The sawdust was all piled in the back of it, just like you see your, your gravel or your sand pile. And we get a little half a stick of dynamite or something and break a little hole in it and bust it open so we could get in and then it all had to be shoveled in the ice house and raked at least 18 or 20 inches of sawdust over the ice to keep it. In the spring blocks would be removed as they were needed, cut to a more manageable size and then cut down again for each commercial and domestic client. Ice cutting and filling remained an important source of work for decades among the local families who stayed the winter. While the lighthouse village grew, there was no reason to travel to the eastern end of the main channel. There was nothing there but the swampy mouth of Sucker Creek. Ruth McQuaig says the path that came through Point of Barrel was called the Old Sledge Road. It was too rough to use except by mail carriers in the winters who used dogs and horses to pull their sleighs once the ground was frozen. In 1908, the railway came through and it changed everything. As the steam tug had opened the east side of Georgian Bay 30 years before, another revolutionary change in transportation would author a whole new chapter in the history of Point of Barrel. The extension of the railway past Perry Sound suddenly connected the little backwater inlet of Sucker Creek to the rest of the world. Virtually overnight, people and goods could travel here from anywhere. Passengers arriving by train at Sucker Creek, slightly later to be renamed Point of Barrel, still needed transport out to the bay. The CPR constructed a cart track down the hill and along Sucker Creek to the harbor. John Perks's horse and wagon ferried the seemingly endless boxes and trunks, all a family would need for the whole of their summer stay, down the steep slope from the train platform to the dock. Perks also operated the first supply and taxi boat from the station wharf out among the islands. Before long, trains arrived in Point of Barrel four times each day, two from the north and two from the south. J.M. and J.O. Reed took on the transportation contract with CPR in 1930. CPR set them up right on the main wharf where they also lived. That residence also housed the village post office for years. The, um CPR Railway was looking for transportation out to the islands and they built a, a summer type cottage uh, right there on the main dock and they stayed there uh, in the summertime and operated a transportation business, uh, passengers and freight. Freight, including food, household products, and building materials, now arrived by train at the station rather than by steamer near the lighthouse. Rail services invited more tourists and more islanders into the area, who in turn increased the demand for more materials and supplies. Mail, which just a decade earlier arrived sporadically by steamer and not at all over the winter, was suddenly delivered twice a day by train. You know, when you talk about things today being so good and everything else, but how much better could you had in the days when there was a post office and the train had two mails a day? You know, you, you could have a letter sent in Perry Sound in the morning, you'd get it in the afternoon. CPR had contracts with for freight delivery on some of these tea boats to get stuff for Simpsons and Eaton's out to the colleges and that. That was the thing, I guess, with Simpsons and Eaton's. When you bought something, it was free delivery on steamboat to these cottages. 
And you probably, if you ordered it early enough the, the previous day, you'd have it the next day. It's phenomenal when you think about it. The only other communication to the outside world was via the CPR station with Morse code and a telegraph. I guess if they were an urgent telegram, they would get somebody to take it out to the codger. In the C.C. Kennedy's business, a lot of the ordering is done by telegrams. Uh, you know, they would send a, a telegram off early in the evening for the supplies to come on the train in the morning. Fish was shipped by rail from here. No need to haul it across Georgian Bay to Meaford anymore. When they were bringing in the fish and getting it ready, my husband used to go pick it up with the boat and take it into Point of Barrel and take it up to the railroad station and put it on the wagon up there so that the trains came in would take the, the fish off to wherever. <laughs> Construction of cottages, docks, and outbuildings was needed by hundreds of New Island families moving in in the early and mid-1900s. Over time, islands passed through successive generations, each of which made additions and improvements, expanding facilities and living space as new family members came along. The construction industry in Point of Barrel took off. After the summer visit, cottages needed to be closed back up, shuttered, secured, and protected from brutal winters. Docks had to be disconnected to avoid damage from wind and shifting ice. In the spring, everything was done in reverse. Repairs fixed winter damage. Renovations and improvements were conducted as contracted. Docks were reattached and boats were serviced and delivered just in time for their owner's arrival. The cottage maintenance industry in Point of Barrel was born. In many cases, cottage opening includes grounds maintenance. Spring cleaning, always a big chore in cottages, is a typical part of the cottage opening service. David Richardson, grandson of the Marina family, tells of his grandmother bringing women from Meaford to provide opening, closing, and all summer cleaning services for the islanders. The cleaning and service industry in Point of Barrel was born. What is now called the recreation industry overtook commercial fishing in the early 1900s as the commercial foundation of Point of Barrel and fuels the local economy to this day. For a few years after the arrival of the train, the area around the station remained little more than a transfer point for a nearly seamless connection between train and steamer. Slowly, people began to set up businesses and raise their families here. They typically worked elsewhere in the winter when water-based service shut down when the ice closed in. The sequence of business development at the station village in the first few decades after the arrival of the railroad is not precisely clear. What is clear is that businesses and services responded to changing demand. John and Emily Perks built a log cabin in 1907 where DeMazins is now. Over the years they ran a construction firm, a steamer service, the livery service that moved freight up and down the CPR hill, and John was also the postmaster at the station village for many years. In 1923, Perks built their grocery and supply store on the main docks and moved it back to its present location in 1934. Daughter Edna Perks was at the helm of that operation for the whole of her life. Edna would marry Crosley Kennedy, and in time the store would bear his name. In 1923, the CPR built a small restaurant on the docks. It was operated by Gordon Jacobs and became a popular breakfast stop for overnight train passengers. Percy Woodward built the first marina near the station in 1922 on the north side of Sucker Creek. Woodward's had boat slips, a gas dock, and a boat repair business that could handle launches up to 30 feet or so. The boats were hoisted up on a crane operated by a hand winch and swung over to a wagon that would roll them into the repair shop. You can tell this was not a good day at Woodward's. Woodward's had a long line of sheds for winter boat storage, increasingly in demand as islanders acquired their own boats. 
Jack McAuliffe, originally an island school teacher, built a grocery store on the water's edge south of the main docks. That store was later run by Benny Pester. Charles Stokes ran a market garden and dairy on the North Shore inside Brignall Banks. Charlie's son Albert drove the delivery boat, taking fresh produce and milk right to Islanders' docks. The Reeds ran passenger and freight steamers and supply boats through the islands, and both Jack McAuliffe and the Kennedys ran grocery and ice boats. Grosskorths ran a supply boat from their store at the point as well. Custom grocery orders right to your door was the standard level of service in the islands in the middle 1900s. Square Barrel Station serviced quite a large area. It serviced the islands, Nares Inlet, Nayscoot Lake, and all the little lakes up, Little Wilson, Big Wilson, Shawnee River area. That's a pretty big area for a small little town to service. From marine stuff to groceries to hardware. And that has continued on right up to today. Despite development at the station, the village at the lighthouse and its surrounding area remained the center of summer life for many years. Groceries, ice, mail, gas, hardware, church, they were all right there. Richardson's Grosskorth's Marina would operate a combined 50 years with booming success. The Macintosh store changed hands a few times but continued to operate into the 1950s. The Ojibwe Hotel also had a post office, grocery store and gas dock, so the growing number of islanders really had all they needed within a short row or leisurely ride in the wee motorized vessels that were beginning to appear. Oh, and by the way, the Ojibwe and Bellevue hotels also had cows of their own, supplying fresh milk to their guests each day. The permanent population grew as businesses were built in the station area. There were now enough children to warrant a local school. Everything and everyone traveled by boat, even at the station village. When we first started the marina in 1946, there was no road around to the marina. Then they had to go over to the in their boat to the government dock um, and we would bring their boat back and, and store it. In 1923, Charles Thorkeldsen built the school on Onacassi Island, later to be called Schoolhouse Island. Children traveled by school boat during the spring, summer and fall. When the water started to freeze over in the fall, school was suspended until the ice was thick enough for the kids to walk, skate, ski, or snowshoe to school. They would put stakes every hundred feet, drill holes in the ice, and put wooden stakes in all the way to the dock at Point of Barrel. So when we went to school in the morning, if it was blowing and snowing, we could find our way to the school or our way back. In the spring, as the ice thinned and became unsafe, school was again suspended until the school boat could run again. Because of this lost time, children in Pointe Barrel had to go to school right through July to make up their full academic year. At first, children in all grades were in one room taught by one teacher. There were only 10 children in the school when it was first built in 1923. That number rose to 35 children by 1934. So far, we have seen the development and growth of two point of barrel villages. A third transportation shift was about to make perhaps the biggest change of all. In 1936, the road came through. A new chapter in our story began and the pace of change accelerated. Islanders and tourists now arrived in their own cars at all times of the day and night. They used their own boats rather than the scheduled steamer service. For the first time, car parking was needed. The road buzzed with traffic and opened a world of opportunity. As many as eight gas stations existed at one time, and at least three of them had service bays for repairs. The population was reported by J.O. Reid to have included 65 families in 1940. Increasing numbers of children warranted two schoolrooms, this picture, which we think was taken while the school was still on the island in 1949, includes 44 children, two teachers, and the school boat driver, Dave Green Sr. 
Gordon Jacobs built his own grocery store and gas bar along the road in 1946. Regular bus service delivered passengers right to the docks. Ernie Gardner talks about how the road changed everyday life for his family. You got by with what you had. You know, uh, he never, we never owned a car on our home. They never owned a car. We always come down to the station and went to town by train. That's how we got our groceries by the train. And then once, once, uh, once the road went through, then there was a truck came up uh, that came up twice a week, I believe, and they would drop your groceries off. You'd order them, and then they dropped them off right where we lived, right at the, at the dive where you met them, and uh, they were they were there. When they said they were going to be there, they were there. Albert de Maison, who had worked for many years on the docks and in motor repair at the Ojibwe Hotel, took over the McTavish boat and marine hardware business on the east side of the road in the 1940s. The Reed Transportation Company was sold to Arnold Wing and then to Evoys in 1949. Jerry and Shane operated freight and passenger service there until just a few years ago. Wallace and Bruce Reed built Reed's Marine in the southeast corner of the harbor. As the boats changed in design and increased in numbers over the years, the marinas had to respond. We built storage buildings for these boats and um, we built them for long, narrow boats. And then the boats changed <laughs> and they became wider. <laughs> we had to build wider. <laughs> And then, and, but they got shorter as well. <laughs> and then they changed from inboards to inboard outboard, or, no, to outboards. And then they changed from outboards to inboard outboards. And now we've got a variety. There are still a few of the launches, what we call the launch, the long, narrow inboard boats. There are still a few of those around Point of Arrow. And it got, once the road was around, we had a piece of their equipment year-round. We either had their car or we had their boat. Kennedy's delivered groceries and ice to as many as 72 customers in a day. We had a, a big supply boat. It had uh, wooden refrigerators and everything in it. We would do 72 calls in a day. And we, on those days, we'd have roughly five tons of ice aboard that had to be carried up to those cottages. So when we, when we arrived at the dock, if I was driving the boat, you had to have all the stuff out of the coolers, everything packed up ready. When you landed and tied the ropes, the stuff went on the dock and you almost ran to the cottages. I'd get up there with the groceries, I'd grab the block of ice in the first cooler and move it to the second cooler, and then the new block of ice went in the main fridge. And that was all uh, cut to size with a nice pick. And my dad was famous for that. He knew every one of them off by heart the size of a day. So not only could you get your groceries brought to your dock, both groceries and ice were delivered right to your ice box. Other businesses were springing up. A bank of commerce opened in Kennedy's store. Cribby's Taxi, Penfold's Restaurant and Gas Bar, William Ellis's Firewood Business and his son Bill Jr.'s Propane Business all came on the scene. Harry Oldfield bought Gordon Jacobs' restaurant that had been on the docks and hauled the whole thing down the road where he ran a restaurant, pool hall and ice house. A community centre was also built on the highway. There are three chapters in the spiritual life of Point of Barrel. In 1907, a small Anglican church was built near the lighthouse. Point of Barrel Station bought the United Church in Bing Inlet for $200, disassembled it, and reconstructed it here at Point of Barrel. It was reopened in 1936 as Florence Universal Church and stands today nearly unchanged over 80 years. Grace Joy Wright, who grew up in Bing Inlet, started playing the church organ there in 1929 at the age of 14. After moving to Point of Barrel, Grace began playing the same organ in the same church, now in a different location. She continued until she was 96 years old. 
As we assemble this video, Grace is 101, undoubtedly the longest living person ever to reside in Pointe of Barrow. In 1936, St. Teresa's Roman Catholic Church was built on a raised site above the South Shore Road donated by Jack McAuliffe. St. Teresa's was sold in 1974 because of poor access and the absence of parking. In the 1950s and 60s, business was booming in the summer worlds of both point of barrels. The permanent population of three to four hundred swelled to perhaps as many as eight thousand. Grosskorths, who bought the Richardson Marina in 1948, also owned Sound Boatworks in Perry Sound, where they too built beautiful wooden boats that became numerous among point of barrel islands. Boat sales and repairs would naturally become a mainstay of the Point of Barrel community, both at the lighthouse and later at the station. The lighthouse marina was a one-stop depot for pretty much anything an islander might need. The Point Marina boasted one of only two telephones in all of the islands. It was a radio telephone located right on the dock installed about 1946. Like its counterpart at the Ojibwe Hotel, it was a popular amenity and people would line up to use it. Archie Taylor built a small marina and store near the lighthouse, not far from the Macintosh store. The Taylors sold groceries, operated a small boat and motor repair service, and stored a few boats for the winter. Taylor ran the post office when the Bellevue closed, but slowly it diminished, closing sometime in the mid-1970s. If our reconstruction of the village is accurate, there would have been as many as five grocery stores in the vicinity operating simultaneously. Ushers, Taylors, Grosskorths, Oldfields, and the Ojibwe. The store that John McIntosh built in 1894 and finally closed in the early 1950s, nearly 60 years after John McIntosh built it. In the 1970s, Grosskorths contracted Bill Ellis Jr. to clear the property, and the landmark was burned to the ground. The Bellevue, Ojibwe, and Scarivore hotels continued to operate through the mid to late 1900s. Sport fishing became a major summer vacation industry, and over the years there were more than a dozen thriving fishing and holiday resorts in or near Point of Barrow. In 1973, Goodwins bought Beacon Marine. Norm recalls there were 19 buildings on that property at the time. The Goodwins continued to repair and refinish wooden boats and did fiberglass work as well. They molded their little fiberglass point boats through the winter months out at their lighthouse location. In 1994, Norm and son Lorne bought Reed's Marine at the station, retaining only winter storage at the lighthouse. For many permanent residents, life was not easy here. The pace of the short construction and boating season make for a grueling business cycle between ice out and ice in. We had a little place, a cabin, a log cabin, two rooms, 10 by 12. We lived in that little cabin for months. No, no hydro, no water, carried water. Never had a fridge as long as we lived there. Hauling water and cutting and hauling firewood required many hours of hard work daily just to survive. The old wood stoves were often pushed to their limits and house fires were common. Many families lost their homes to fire, some more than once. Families augmented their income however they could. Some had gardens, but the soil in this area does not produce bountiful harvests. A few people kept a bit of livestock, chickens and pigs, but again, that was difficult on this land. Many, if not most, point of barrel families supplemented their existence through hunting and fishing. Ducks and geese, grouse, pheasants and woodcocks, along with deer, moose and bear meat, have helped to sustain many families through long winters. Ice fishing was a common way to extend food stocks through those long off-season stretches. Trapping has always been a way of life for some in Point of Barrel. Ernie Gardner's father, Minto, brought his family here in 1933. Minto, his sons, and even his grandson and great-nephew have trapped the same line Minto started some 80 years ago. Ernie ran that line for 54 of those years. 
There have been as many as five or six trappers operating their own winter trap lines in this area at any given time. The snowmobile changed the nature of trapping in the 1960s. The extreme physical demands of that way of life were relieved a bit. Declining fur prices over the last few decades have made trapping a marginal occupation for local trappers, most of whom are continuing their family's tradition for nearly 80 years. This was a tight-knit community, and community life here in the mid to late 1900s was active and involved. With roads finally along both north and south shores, a new school was erected in 1949 on the mainland, where the community centre is now. By that time, the number of children had more than doubled to around 50 or 60 students. When it moved from the island to there, uh, I guess that was the late 40s when that happened yeah. in Murray, and then a, a road got put around to it. Uh, I went to school there, and you know, there was two, two classrooms. And, uh, they held concerts there, you know, before Christmas, and the hall, hallway was filled too because there was no room to get people in there. <laughs> they were jammed in there like sardines, but you know, it's, people really loved that. According to Wally Reed's memoirs, Hydro arrived in Pointe Barrel in 1951 and went as far as the school. In 1952, the service was continued on along the South Shore, although it would be nearly a decade before the North and South Shore roads were more than just tracks. Lots of community activities, concerts, pageants, socials and children's parties were organized out of the village school. Rinks were flooded and men's and women's hockey were very popular. A wealth of other community events and activities brought people together in a spirit of neighborliness and mutual support. But when you're in a small community like this, you have to make your own. I mean, we visited neighbors. We didn't have any phones to say I'm coming or anything. We dropped in. And our social life was really quite, quite active. For a time, you might say there were two point of barrels. By the 1950s and 60s, pretty much everything and everyone were moving through the station, and that began to shift the center of gravity eastwards from the lighthouse. Interestingly, in Point of Barrel, the direction of transportation was beginning to reverse. Whereas everything used to come to the lighthouse and be shipped south through the islands and east to the station, now everything was arriving by truck at Point of Barrel Station and had to be transported in the other direction. Everything had to travel westward now. Islanders arrived exclusively by car, as CPR closed passenger service in 1954. Their boats needed to be at the station so they could unload their cargo and be on their way. When they were ready to go home, they would boat to the station docks and of course leave their boats there. Docking at the lighthouse now became impractical. Norm Goodwin says the marina at the lighthouse had become unsustainable at the wrong end of the travel route. Their purchase of reeds put them back at the proper end of the transportation chain. The Bellevue, constructed in 1900, burned completely in the late 1920s and was rebuilt by 1930. It continued to operate for another 34 years, finally closing in 1964, the same year that the Ojibwe Hotel became a private club. The greatest majority of the fishing and cottaging resorts have now closed. Rock Pine Resort and Cottages and Moose Lake Lodge Cottage Resorts still thrive, and Pleasant Cove Resort carries on at a smaller scale, but the others are all gone. As the one point of barrel village shrunk, the other was bustling. The eastern point of barrel was now the undisputed hub of marine activity. The first phone at the station was a payphone outside Kennedy's store. Around, uh... 1950 or so, I guess, the phones came in, and my husband was asked by the phone company to make the first long-distance call. He was told he could phone anywhere in the world, but he didn't know people all over the world. <laughs> he phoned my mother. <laughs> Shore roads, hydro, and telephone service modernized the village in the early 1950s. The Point of Barrel Nursing Station was built in 1985 and expanded in 1996. The community center was built in 1989, the 100th anniversary of the building of the lighthouse. <laughs> B. 
Beacon Marine is the one remaining business that survived the transition from the lighthouse to the station. It represents an unbroken thread of a single commercial enterprise stretching more than 100 years from Albert Richardson's founding of his marina in 1916. Albert de Mason rebuilt his marina business in the early 1970s on the North Shore Road. His sons and their wives, Joe and Linda, Stan and Terry, took over the marina and construction business, which was sold to Andy and Tanya Blencarn in 1998. The marina still carries the de Maison name. Payne's Marina was founded by Vince Payne and his son Mike in 1961. They established their business on the south shore of the Point of Barrel Narrows as a water access only marina until they put a road through in 1967. In 1994, Mark, the third generation Payne, joined the business and all three Payne men worked together for about six years until Vince retired in the year 2000. Four other marine service businesses are in the immediate area including Leisure Bay, Rolfs Marina, JMK and Sturgeon Bay Marina. Point of Barrel's boat building industry has died away. However, there is still a special boat builder in Point of Barrel who does it as much for the fun as a commercial venture. Bob Madigan buys old tugs and magically transforms them into beautiful and functional vessels. Construction and maintenance of island properties is the heart of present-day Point of Barrel. There are at least 15 of these businesses operating, and they range from small renovation and maintenance firms to large full-service construction companies capable of producing awe-inspiring architectural art. That's 15 companies operating in a village that has a permanent population of about 250 to 300 people. Our Point of Barrel vicinity has probably the most numerous concentration of islands anywhere in Georgian Bay, and all of those properties are water access only. That creates unique political, environmental and stewardship challenges and needs. In 1980, the Township of the Archipelago was created to address and serve the specific interests of the shore and island populations. Two of the ten township councillors represent the village of Point of Barrel. The township supplies a range of services and facilities in the Point of Barrel community. The West Perry Sound Health Centre completely rebuilt Point of Barrel's nursing station in 2017. Nurse practitioner Patty Riches has been providing primary health care to permanent and island residents here since 1985. It may be fair to say that Patty is one of Point of Barrel's most valued and appreciated assets. The greatest majority of people who have experienced Point of Barrel, many through the whole of their lifetimes, have known it only in the summer. Few visitors or islanders have ever been here between ice in and ice out. But the whole story is that Point of Barrel is a four-season community. Hunting season for various species opens in the fall, spawning an exodus of residents and employees to the bush for the deer and moose hunting seasons. While the classic beauty of the summer water, the granite shores and the windswept pines is undisputed, the spectacle of yellows and crimsons and neon oranges of autumn foliage is arguably a match for summer splendor. When winter comes, Point of Barrel becomes different, but many would argue no less beautiful. First it gets quiet. But then begins the excitement of Ontario in winter. Snowmobiles are numerous, the popular winter recreational pastime. Entry to the provincial snowmobile trail system just a few hundred meters east of the highway gives direct access to over 30,000 kilometers of trails throughout Ontario. Once the ice is well frozen, Georgian Bay itself becomes accessible by snowmobile and in good ice years, hundreds of kilometers become accessible cross-country skiing, snowshoeing and hiking through the supreme solitude of a winter bush or a cookout on the ice on a sunny winter day are unparalleled pleasures. When the conditions are right, scoots make their appearance. The perfect vehicle for those ice-water in-between periods. Our locals have usually built their own scoots. In this old photo are some of the earliest prototypes of the modern scoot. 
People from away imagine isolation and maybe even desolation in the winter point of barrel. But the truth is that snowstorms come and go, leaving in their wake wonderlands of winter white that blanket ground and ice and rocks and trees in breathtaking beauty. Winter offers a break from the furious pace of work in the other three seasons. The Christmas season is marked by the seniors' Christmas dinner and the community Christmas party, a decades-long tradition wherein Santa distributes customized presents to all the children in the village. As spring approaches, the local snowmobile club organizes its signature fundraiser, followed by Canada Day celebrations, Arts on the Bay dinner concerts, the church rummage sale, Remembrance Day ceremonies, and other community events. Bustling community and family life has decreased over the last few decades. The local school was closed in 1979 amid much controversy. There isn't the same connection. Um, when you're in a small school, you know everybody and you, you get on, you know, do things together. And um, when you're in a big school, you don't know your neighbor. And a lot of people didn't want their kids going on the bus. So some of them moved out at that point. And that was the beginning of the decline of. Uh, families in Point of Barrow. But in there, all the families were together and, and they all were in together. Not just a few of the families, but all of them. And it's just got, it's just not that way anymore. When we lost our school, we lost the center of our community. The absence of children and youth has changed the nature of community life here. Gone is the catalyst that unified the village for decades. Fewer young families means fewer employees who are so critical to the local economy. The population that remains is disproportionately older. There are fewer people to sustain traditional volunteer activities and services. The volunteer emergency response team that for many years offered both fire and medical response services folded in 2015 because of the lack of volunteers. Residents miss the great pickerel dinners, the socials and dances, the lobster fest, the snowmobile club's winter whirl, all those traditional community gatherings that underpin village life. In the last few decades, as the permanent population of Point of Barrel has declined, the business base has also shrunk. Woodward's was sold to Neil and George Ryder, after which it passed to private hands and faded away. While once there were four marinas operating in the harbor, now there are two. At one time, there were two hardware stores and three grocery stores. Now there is one of each. The Chamber of Commerce closed, and shortly after that, so did the visitor center on the highway. It's unlikely that Point of Barrel will return to its high pitch of the 1950s and 60s when the school was full of children and the village population was at its peak. There are hopeful signs of community renewal. Once again, the area's unparalleled beauty is capturing people's hearts and drawing new residents to Point of Barrel. There is an energy to organize community activities among the newer residents, many of whom have recently retired to this area. They may be the builders of a new future here. Natural resources and transportation have continuously shaped and reshaped Point of Barrel. The village that arose at the edge of the open water 135 years ago adapted. It reinvented itself in its present location, 11 kilometers to the east, as conditions changed, resources diminished, new opportunities arose. The road that first came to Point of Barrel so long ago in 1936 is about to undergo another transformation. When the four-lane highway reaches here in the next few years, it will reroute the volume of summer traffic on a bypass. Point of Barrel will undoubtedly transform again, in the certainty that our summer residents and guests will keep coming to Point of Barrel as they have done for over a century. The core businesses and permanent residents of Point of Barrel will continue to be here to provide the support, services and amenities that sustain both our island neighbours and our station community. 
no discussion of Point of Barrel can close without note of its unmatched allure and world-class environment, which make this truly one of the most beautiful places on Earth. <laughs>